Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar where we will be discussing shock and PALS. Shock is defined as a condition in which peripheral tissues and end organs do not receive adequate oxygen and nutrients. While it's sometimes used interchangeably with severe hypotension, shock does not only occur in the setting of severely low blood pressure. Importantly, the body will attempt to compensate for shock through various mechanisms, most commonly through increased heart rate. The heart rate will increase in an attempt to increase cardiac output, such as stroke volume times heart rate. Blood flow will be shunted from less vital organs, such as the skin, to more vital organs, such as the kidneys and the brain. In these cases, the child or the infant may be experiencing shock but have high normal or low normal blood pressure. This is called compensatory shock and may only persist for minutes to hours before progressing to frank uncompensated shock unless treatment is initiated. Without treatment, these compensatory systems can become overwhelmed and result in the child progressing quickly to critical hypotension and cardiac arrest. Therefore, the simple assessment of blood pressure is not a sufficient way to evaluate potential shock in pediatrics. There are four types of shock that we are going to discuss. So hypovolemic, meaning low blood volume, often due to a hemorrhage or fluid shifting out of the vasculature. Distributed, which is blood vessel dilation um, or septic shock. Cardiogenic, which is results from when the heart is not pumping adequately, and obstructive, which is the physical block of the blood flow. So hypovolemic shock is the most common type of shock and perhaps the easiest to understand. Hypovolemic shock results from insufficient blood in the cardiovascular system. This can be due to hemorrhage externally or into the peritoneum or into the gastrointestinal system. Hypovolemic shock in children can also occur from water loss, perspiration, diarrhea, vomiting, or when fluid moves into the tissue, third spacing. In hypovolemic shock, preload to the heart is decreased through contractility is increased or in normal. Likewise, afterload is increased since the vessels have constricted in an attempt to increase blood pressure. The primary means of responding to hypovolemic shock is to provide additional volume. For children, an isotonic crystalloid such as normal saline or lactated ringers is the preferred fluid for volume resuscitation. While volume repletion is somewhat straightforward in adults, great care must be taken when administering intravenous fluids to children and infants. Careful estimates should be made concerning the amount of volume loss, the size of the person, and the degree of the deficit. Current recommendations are to administer 20 milliliters per kilogram of fluid as a bolus over 5 to 10 minutes and repeat as needed. In hypovolemic shock, administer 3 milliliters of fluid for every 1 milliliter of estimated blood loss, a 3 to 1 ratio. If fluid boluses do not improve the signs of hypovolemic hemorrhagic shock, consider administration of packed red blood cells without delay. Albumin can also be considered for additional intravenous volume for shock, trauma, and burns as a plasma expander. If fluid bol boluses do not improve the signs of hypovolemic hemorrhagic shock, reevaluation of proper diagnosis in occult blood loss should be considered. Distributed shock is a condition in which the majority of blood in a is inappropriately distributed in the vasculature. A common way to conceptualize distributive shock is as a condition in which the vasculature has relaxed and dilated to the point of inadequacy. The arterial blood supply needs to maintain a certain tension in order to maintain blood pressure. Likewise, the venous system must maintain tension as well, so as not to retain too much of the total blood supply. In distributive shock, the blood is not being maintained in the required and needed useful blood vessels. Distributive shock is most commonly caused by sepsis, anaphylaxis, or a neurological problem, all of which cause vascular dilation or loss of blood vessel tone. In distributive shock, the preload, contractility, and afterload vary depending on the etiology. Distributive shock is difficult to recognize because the signs and symptoms vary greatly depending on the etiology. Common symptoms include tachypnea, 
tachycardia, low to normal blood pressure, decreased urine output, and decreased level of consciousness. Distributive shock is further categorized into warm and cold shock. If the person is experiencing warm shock, they commonly will have warm, peripheral skin and a wide pulse pressure in the setting of hypotension. If the person is experiencing cold shock, they commonly will have pale, vasoconstricted skin and narrow pulse pressure hypotension. In each case, distributive shock is generally considered when the person is likely to have one of the three main causes, sepsis, anaphylaxis, or neurological problem. The initial management of distributive shock is to increase intravascular volume. The intent is to provide enough volume to overcome the inappropriate redistribution of existing volume. As with hypovolemic shock, administer 20 milliliters per kilogram of fluid as a bolus over 5 to 10 minutes and repeat as needed. Beyond initial management, therapy is tailored to the cause of the distributive shock. In septic shock, aggressive fluid management is generally necessary. Broad-spectrum intravenous antibiotics are a key intervention and should be administered as soon as possible. In addition, a stress dose of hydrocortisone, especially with adrenal insufficiency and vasopressors, may be needed to support blood pressure. After fluid resuscitation, vasopressors are given if needed and according to the type of septic shock. Normotensive persons are usually given dopamine. Warm shock is treated with norepinephrine and cold shock is treated with epinephrine. Transfusing packaged red blood cells to bring hemoglobin above 10 grams per DL treats decreased oxygen carrying capacity. As blood cultures return, focus antibiotic therapy to the particular microbe and its resistance patterns. Intramuscular epinephrine is the first and most important treatment for anaphylactic shock. If severe cases, a second dose of epinephrine may be needed or intravenous administration may be required. Crystalloid fluid may be administered judiciously. Remember that in anaphylactic shock, capillary permeability may increase considerably. Thus, while it is important to support blood pressure overall, there is a significant likelihood that third spacing and pulmonary edema will occur. Antihistamines and quarter steroids also can blunt the anaphylactic response. If breathing challenges arrive, consider albuterol use to achieve bronchodilation. In very severe cases of anaphylactic shock, a continuous epinephrine infusion in the neonatal intensive care unit or NICU or pediatric intensive care unit or PICU may be required. Neurogenic shock is clinically challenging because often there is limited ability to the correct insult. Injury to the autonomic pathways in the spinal cord results in decreased systematic vascular resistance and hypotension. An inappropriately low pulse or bradycardia is a clinical sign of neurogenic shock. Therefore, treatment is focused on fluids first. 20 milliliters per kilogram, bolus over 5 to 10 minutes, then reassess the person for a response. If hypotension does not respond to fluid resuscitation, vasopressors are needed. This resuscitation should be done in conjunction with a broader neurological evaluation and treatment plan. Cardiogenic shock is caused by inadequate contractility of the heart. One of the key differences between hypovolemic and cardiogenic shock is the work of breathing. In both cases, there will be tachypnea, but in hypovolemic shock, the effort of breathing is only mildly increased. However, in cardiogenic shock, the work of breathing is often significantly increased as evidenced by grunts, nasal flaring, and the use of accessory thorax muscles. Also, since the heart is pumping ineffectively, blood remains in the pulmonary vasculature. This causes pulmonary congestion and edema, which can be clinically be heard as crackles in the lungs and visualized as jugular vein distension. Pulses are often weak, capillary refill is slow, extremities are cool and cyanotic, and there may be a decrease in the level of consciousness. Since children in cardiogenic shock have a problem with cardiac contractility, the primary goal of therapy is to restore contractility. Unlike most other types of shock, fluid resuscitation is not a primary intervention in cardiogenic shock. Often medications to support contractility and reduce afterload are first-line treatments. In normotensive patients, this means vasodilators and diuretics. Contractility is supported with inotropes. 
Milrinone is often used to decrease peripheral vascular resistance. When additional volume is needed, fluid can be administered slowly and cautiously, 5 to 10 milliliters per kilogram over 10 to 20 minutes. A pediatric cardiologist or critical care specialist should manage persons with cardiogenic shock. Lastly is obstructive shock, which is similar to cardiogenic shock in that the impaired heart function is the primary abnormality. In cardiogenic shock, the contractility is impaired, but in obstructive shock, the heart is prevented from contracting appropriately. Common causes of obstructive shock are cardiac tamponade, tension pneumothorax, congenital heart malformations, and pulmonary embolism. Obstructive and cardiogenic shock is most easily distinguished by the contractility of the heart. In obstructive shock, heart contractility is normal, although pumping function is not. Cardiac tamponade is associated with muffled heart sounds since blood is present in the pericardial space. Pulses paradoxus may also be present. Tension pneumothorax is a clinical diagnosis. The trachea may be deviated away from the side of the lesion, and there are absent breath sounds over the affected side of the chest. Consider a pulmonary embolism when the person is cyanotic and or hypotensive, experiences chest pain, and has respiratory distress without lung pathology or airway obstruction. Risk factors include obesity, hormone use, family use of abnormal clotting, and coagulation factor abnormalities. Causes of obstructive shock require rapid and definitive care since they are acutely life-threatening. Cardiac tamponade requires pericardial drainage. Tension pneumothorax requires needle decompression and subsequent placement of a chest tube. Pediatric heart surgeons can address vascular abnormalities and ductus aerotosis can be induced to remain open by administering um, proscladin E1 analogs. Pulmonary embolism care is mostly supportive through trained personnel can administer fibrolytic and anticoagulant agents. Management of these complex etiologies is beyond the scope of this webinar. Thank you so much for tuning into today's webinar. Don't forget we offer online PAL certification on our site. You can find a link in the description. We encourage you to become certified as soon as possible, whether that be on your own time with an online course or in an in-classroom setting. So thank you again. We hope to catch you the next time.